quite a strong word in my heart. We all know the unfolding story of Israel. They wanted a king like the nations that surrounded them. 1 Samuel chapter 8. It was a statement much like the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve chose to usurp the throne and to take their own seat upon the throne. 1 Samuel 8 was a reprise of Genesis 3 inasmuch as they no longer wanted Yahweh on the throne of Israel. They wanted a king like the kings of the nations that surrounded them. And we all know that Saul emerged as king. Taller than the others, more handsome than the others, more vigorous and rigorous than the others. And yet his heart had been seduced by the praise and the applause and the appreciation of the crowd, of the many. And it was under his watch that that which symbolized the manifest glory of God, the Ark of the Covenant, where the very Shekinah glory of God would rest between the cherubim on the mercy seat was lost to the Philistines. It took a, a shepherd, the least of his brothers, the least tribe, forgotten out in the fields to be chosen of God, to begin to lead a restoration that would foreshadow what the true David would do, the Christ, Messiah, King, Jesus. He was not the tallest. He was not the most favored. Not even the prophet had eyes to see, but Yahweh did. And it took David, whose heart was fully his, in Psalm 28, repeatedly said, one thing I ask of the Lord, this one thing that I seek. Not the applause of man, not the applause of many, not the applause of the crowd, not the fame and the affirmation and uh, the acclamation of the people. But this one thing did he seek. That he would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. And to seek him in the beauty of his temple. To seek him one thing, one thing, one thing. And David in all of his humanity was a foreshadowing of King Jesus, the true David. I felt the Lord say that in this time around the world... We live in the last days. We live in the last dispensation. Let me just say this. There aren't dispensations upon dispensations. When Christ ascended and poured out His Spirit, the one last age began. The, the age before the consummation of all things. The age of the church in the Spirit, by the Spirit, has come. But yet, but in this time, God is reminding the church through everything that we globally are going through that the church is shifting from Saulish leadership to Davidic leadership. From Saulish leadership where the church and her leaders are more aware of, bent by, lured by, seduced by the affirmation the acclamation and the praise of the people even within the pews, let alone the people on the streets whom we meant to reach. And in that process, the Saulish church has laid down her power, has laid down her power, and her power is not in her preaching, her power is not in her worship, her power is not in her hands or her branding. Her power has always been Christ with them. And in this time, the church is remembering one thing. And in this time, 
The church is remembering the one thing. And the one thing is the one. Him and Him alone. And I heard in my heart, a dear brother came to pray for me and bless me. And bless him, he was blessed equally like I was. Because that's how it rolls. And as he moved off, I heard the word of the Lord come to me. In 1 Chronicles 17, I think it is, maybe, somewhere there. Where Nathan, the prophet, comes to David and says to him, David, do whatever you find in your heart to do. Remember, David's heart had already been obsessed with one thing. Interesting. David says, how can I live in this palace? When the Ark of the Covenant, the place of one abiding with them, does not have a home. And he said in that moment, I will set it apart. I will set all that I do. The one thing I do as king is to make provision is to make space, is to set it apart, to pursue one thing, to make a home, not for a passing pastoral visitation of Yahweh, but the abiding manifest glory of God, the prize, the pursuit, the honor. And it was in that moment that Nathan, by the spirit of the living God, said this, I want you to know, it is not for you to build it, but your son will, but I say this to you, I will establish your house. I will establish your house. And he found Yahweh looking through all the times and all the seasons found a, a king whose heart was fully his, one thing. And that king began to embody the future king, the eternal king who would come with one pursuit with one passion, with one prize, to rend the heavens, to open up the way, and not for Israel to be the home and the abiding place of the eternal God, but for the true temple, all creation, throughout the ages, every nation, every tribe, and every tongue to be the home of the living God. A kingdom of priests set apart whose one passion was not to be king, but to be priests. And therein become a kingdom, his kingdom. The day of the soulless church is being exposed. And the day of the true Davidic house is rising. I love this morning. I bless the worship team who was sensitive enough to allow the praises of the priests. That's you. I forgot my dog collar. That's me. To worship the one king with one pursuit and one prize, one passion. Because he has one pursuit, one prize, and one passion. And that's you. With him. One thing. Lord, I prophesy. This is not my sermon. I need my Bible. But I prophesy over Oasis. And I prophesy in this time. Thanks, Shawnee. Stop it. You're carrying my Bible. Oh, gosh. Help me. Oh, thanks. And my water, too. <laughs> I prophesy as we stand here today, the 24th of April, 2022, what you started at Pentecost, O oh Lord, let it gain momentum. Let it gain momentum, O oh God. Come what may, let it gain momentum. A one thing community with a one thing passion. Doesn't matter who the heck leads worship. Doesn't matter what song we're singing. It doesn't matter where we are, whether we're under a tree or in a cool building. We have one thing burning on our hearts. And that is the glory and the majesty, and the splendor, and the wonder of the one king. King Jesus. All hail King Jesus. 
And let the church arise out of her slumber. Let the church arise. May she arise out of her soulishness into the true Davidic mantle. David's tent rebuilt in these days. And everybody says, Amen. And amen. Yay. Good morning. Melis, why don't you come and say hello quickly? I need a sip of water. <laughs> Glory. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, it's so, so lovely to be here. Really. We just love coming up to visit you guys. It's very special. We love you, Matt and Donnie, very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just greetings from Freedom House on the North Coast. And yeah, just want to say we love being here with you guys. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. That was very kind of you, Mel. We do love them. And do you know what's actually, Mel, do you know that t this weekend is Freedom House fifth anniversary? Do you know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, we are celebrating five years with you. It's our party, and you can come if you want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, five years. Can you believe it? Whenever we come here, there are lots of churches we get to hang out with and whatnot. You guys have such a cool space. We're just still in a shed. And we absolutely love it. Um, we really do. Uh, we don't worship at the altar of a shed. God has unfolding plans and purposes for us. But we want to make sure that we learn what only we can learn in the seasons we find ourselves in. And... Uh, Every time we gather together as the church, it's as if God is speaking into our very being. It's not about the brick or the mortar. You are the living stones. Isn't that true? Yes, I like you already. <laughs> He's with me. Preach with me this morning. And uh, before I welcome our preacher, Fred's preaching this morning. <laughs> Little uh, in-house joke here. But we, we do. We bless you. Uh, Freedom House has endured many things. We've had some rain of late. Uh, can you believe it? Sure. Who would have thought that 400 mils in like 36 hours just over would come plummeting from the heavens upon our craniums and wash away? I've never seen devastation like this. It's just ridiculous. But we are enduring. Isn't that true? You know, last year, it was last year we were with you. We, yeah, you were on sabbatical. Good for you. Yay, good idea. We're glad we helped you on that process. Go on sabbatical, you good things. And I remember the last time we preached here, I preached out of Acts chapter 2, that the church under pressure cannot look to politicians, the Romans, Institutionalized religion, Judaism. Careful. Is that you, Lord? I don't know. I'm scared now. Holy ground. Can't look inwards to their own abilities and strengths and wherewithal and know how and experience and knowledge. They only had one place to look up. Because from Him comes our help. Psalm 121, isn't that true? I found myself praying before I get into what I need to share this morning. I found myself praying this week. One, 2 Samuel 5 verse 20. Does anyone know that scripture by heart? As the waters break out, so the Lord will break out against his enemies. I found myself praying this week. Lord, the waters are breaking out, but come. Come and break out against your enemies. I want you to know something, Oasis. God is not a peacekeeper. You know, like the UN is a peacekeeping force. They come in to war-torn situations and they dance on eggshells. So make sure everyone's okay. Have we met your needs? Even the enemy? Are you okay? Come and sit at the table, you naughty vagabonds, but we won't say that because we're so PC, because we are peacekeepers and we're here not to stir it up. We, we're here to calm it all down. And everyone sit at the table, be polite to each other, and everyone keeps the peace. And one month later, 
That rapscallion of an enemy is back to no good, doing what no good rapscallions do. I want you to know something as we were worshiping uh, earlier on and we were singing about God's wonderful peace. He's not a peacekeeping God. He's a peacemaking God. And he goes to war against every enemy of his people. Not to keep the enemy at the table and keep him appeased like a good old PC king, you know. But to eradicate him from the land. And Christ our king came to make peace, not keep peace at Calvary. Where he gave his life, not with the kingdom of this world. Where he said to Pilate, I preached on this a couple of weeks ago on a good Friday night. We had a Friday night, good Friday And he said, we haven't come to make war like you've come to make war. My kingdom is from another kingdom. And little did they know that the sword was not the sword of Rome or the sword of rebellion, but the sword of a life laid down, Calvary, Golgotha, that would change the game for all of humanity. But he did not come to keep peace. Why am I saying that to you? Again, I felt to say this, Oasis, in this time of seeking out peace, it's not to keep peace. Holy Spirit is at war. He's at war against every lesser kingdom and every false kingdom and every idolatrous kingdom that lives out there, of course. And certainly not in the four walls of Oasis. But go to war against every soulish lesser kingdom. Because there is a river who makes glad the streets of our God. And it comes from one throne. Can you say one throne? We were praying this morning. And uh, Ezekiel 47 came out. I love it. And as we were praying, I realized that one river comes from one throne. And it's as if during this time, I'm so excited to be here. Yay, God is here. Woo. He is reminding his people, there is one river that makes us glad, but that one river comes from one throne. I want to ask you, what throne do you really worship before? Because I'm asking myself that question a lot. I'm not questioning my salvation. I am born again, blood washed, cornerstone, foundation, born again to the power of 10. I'm born again. But you know what I have found equally true? Is that we can abandon the kingdom of God For the sake of safe, sanctimonious salvation. Everyone's praying, thy kingdom come. Good old King James Version this morning. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But there is only a coming of a kingdom because we choose to follow one king. Are you all there this morning? Or are you all watching me at home? I need you to work with me this morning. I want you to preach with me this morning. It's teamwork. Everyone wants to be saved. Who doesn't want to be saved? Like, honestly, who wants to burn in hell? And let me tell you, with all the universalist uh, tendencies wrapping its tentacles around the gospel, around the world, I promise you something. Any healthy, humble approach of the text, you can't work it any other way. There is a consummation of the age where we will stand and make an assessment of our lives before God. And tragically, and the one whose heart will break the most is Christ our King himself. But there is an outcome. Who doesn't want to be saved? Anybody here? Don't put up your hand, please. We'll pray for your salvation. Of course we want to be saved. But do we want a king? There's a very big difference. So this morning, here I am. I'm full of fire. 
Everyone's feeling rather discouraged of late. I promise you, I don't know what's going on. I don't feel discouraged. Do I feel weary? I'm weary, weary. Of course I'm weary. I have four children. I have two teenagers. Oh, Lord, help me. I'm weary of saying the same thing over and over again. I'm 44 and still on the dance floor. I'm weary. I want to eat chocolate cake, but my body is telling me not to. Because I want to live a long and fruitful life. Hey, Dom, Marat, come on. I'm weary because I'm doing pull-ups. I'm weary because I'm studying more. I'm weary because when you live a full and fearsome life, you get tired. Last time I checked in 40, Isaiah 40 says, even the lighties get tired. Not just the madala balis, you know. Everyone gets tired. Paul himself said, I work harder than any of you, yet not I, but the grace of God inside of me. So we all work, working hard, but even while I'm weary, there is something beginning to burn in me that, I, that I'm seriously excited about. And it is the kingdom of God at a whole new level. Wow. Anybody else getting excited? The last few years, let's just state the obvious here. I'm loving your hair. You look amazing. I haven't seen you for a while. You look absolutely wonderful. I had to look twice, and I wasn't, it wasn't one of those looks. You look beautiful and amazing. Are you well? Yes. Sorry, distracted. It's family, hey. <laughs> I hope I haven't embarrassed you and all the cameras in the house. <laughs> It was just the Lord speaking to you. Maybe, maybe, most likely. The last two years, let's state the obvious, has been wretched. Anyone else agree with me? Oh gosh, COVID, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Guys, Coronaviruses have been around a long time. They ain't going nowhere until Jesus returns and stamps all disease and wretched things out and renews all things, okay? But wow, how has it been? Interesting, to say the least. And then last year, did you notice something happened in June, June July? Riot! <laughs> well, that was just horrific. I haven't seen so many guns in my life. I've never been so fired up in the nicest way possible, to get one myself. I've never spent so much time on a shooting range in all my life since I was young. Grew up with guns in my house. No, I don't own a gun. I'm not a Texan yet. Right, it's crazy. We thought that we, we were being shaken. And then we were shaken some more, and then the rains came. Wow. Have you noticed? One thing after the next. But you know what I've noticed through all of this? That somehow the church still seems to seek out solace at the wrong places. Hopelessness seems to pervade. Have you noticed that? I wonder why. Maybe it's not because we're weary. Maybe, just maybe, it's because we have been seeking hope in things that promise the facade of hope. But are no sources of hope at all. Maybe, just maybe, there's pervasive hopelessness because we have been worshiping at the altar of the praise and the affirmation of people. We have been worshiping at the altar of identity in all the wrong places. We have been, maybe we have been. I have. And Jesus has come in his kind graciousness. And the obvious statement is this, he has not been the author of this. Just to state it one more time, lest you have forgotten the truth. He is not the author of destruction. We know where that comes from. 
that he is good, extremely good. Let's actually tell the truth. Very good at taking the worst scenario to establish something unshakable. And the last time I checked, my, my um, identity sadly shakes from time to time because I like to form it around the wrong things. Anybody else? My emotions shake and quake. But the unshakable is the kingdom of our Lord and our Christ. We, for one year, Freedom House, have been preaching through the best book of the Bible. No, it's not Job. And Job, actually, if we teach it, preach it, and understand it correctly, is breathtaking. I think I shall do it soon. It's Hebrews, written to a people who have not lost anything because of riots and rain. They have lost homes and loved ones and family members because of their allegiance to Christ the King. Friends, you must understand that they weren't being given slaps on the wrist. They were losing their lives for following Jesus. Oh, I'm tired of following Jesus. Everybody at the office keeps ragging me for being like a happy clappy. I'm going to give up on you, Jesus. Oh, gosh. You know that there are more martyrs today than ever in church history. Just do a little study. And so the spirit of the living God inspires whomever the author is to write the book of Hebrews, an antidote to tapping out on Jesus because the pressure was on. And the antidote was not a church meeting where we said, pull your socks up and keep going. Like good old English, you know, Christians. Stiff upper lip. Or hardcore South African pioneers. We're going to do it, man. They're going to make it happen. Or Zimbos. Or Wenwees. Or whatever you want to call them. Fast bait. No. The antidote to horrific crisis, if you've read Hebrews, is Christ. The simplicity, the beauty, and the majesty of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Not a podcast. Jesus. Not a devotional book. Jesus. Not a coffee pick me up. Jesus. My question to myself, this is why I'm being so fierce. In asking this question, I think I'm an Enneagram 8, clearly. Is this. To whom is the church turning now? And to whom will the church return again once the pressure starts alleviating? So turn in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. You should know it off by heart. God dropped this prayer inside my, uh, this uh, passage inside my heart about four weeks ago. And um, as a church leader, I've only been in ministry uh, for 23 years. I've only been fo following Christ uh, for 28, but they have been the best. Best decision I ever made when I was 17. That means I'm turning 45 soon. But as a church leader, you get to see some things in the church, things that excite you, things that terrify you, things that elate you, and things that so deeply disappoint you, all within the body of Christ. And yet in the midst of all of this, I've never been so excited as I am today. I stand before you, Oasis, I'm so excited for you. You and I. Freedom House, the church globally, has an opportunity in this time to step into places and spaces that no other time in human history could afford us. The opportunity is at hand. 
if we would have eyes to see and ears to hear. And there's nothing new under the sun. And the opportunity is not cool, church. The opportunity is Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, where Jesus says, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of humanity. Come. Did you hear that? This resounding cry throughout the halls of humanity. Come, follow me, and I will make you to be fishers of humanity. The new NIV says, I will send you out, which I will get to in a minute. There's three things I want to point to you. Are you following me this morning? I feel like I'm prowling like a lion here. I said I would come over here and hunt you down. Hello. There's three things. Number one, there is the resounding resonant call to come. And I want to spend some time in a moment on that. Number two. Number two. Number two. Just resonant sound. Number two, there is construction. I will make you. Or should we say reconstruction? I'll touch on that in a minute. And number three, there is commission. I will make you, I will send you to be a fisher of humanity. Three things, which is the coat rack, as it were, of the mandate of the kingdom of God. Come, construction, commission. Three things, Christ, construction, commission. I'll say it again. Christ, construction, and commission. This time that we're in is a time of radical reconstruction. Do any measure of reading, you will see the talk along the airwaves of social media and the clever people and the influences is we are under construction. Rocket Science, PhD 101. Yes, we are realizing in this moment that there are some things that we have embraced that we should never have embraced and that we should let go and, and, and get rid of instantly in our lives. And we've realized in this process in all of life, from church, uh, the list goes on. We've realized there's some good things, very little good things that we are actually doing. And we have gone, oh, Gosh, help us, Lord. We're under construction. Husbands have realized that their husbanding has fallen short. We spend more time at the office, more time on Facebook, more time on Instagram. Is there such a thing? Yes. More time in the news, more time following sports than loving wife and kids. Wives have realized the same thing. Children have not realized it yet. That's why they have mums and dads. <laughs> Just kidding. You can see I'm in a teenage phase. <sighs> but there is construction. It is a tender time. It is an honest time. It is an exposing time. It's a humbling time. It's a time... Where we are looking inward, isn't that true? We are reassessing. And in all of this, I hear a holy, gracious, gentle warning from heaven. That an, unless our construction or our reconstruction takes place within the all-encompassing embrace of one, Christ, and two, His commission, we will reduce our lives as believers to some secular, self-absorbed, individualistic, introspective community that looks little like Jesus, and all they might rise to is a reduction of the kingdom called social justice. And in all of this, we think we are Christ followers. I hear the Lord saying this to the church. I preached this at Emmanuel two weeks ago, and I tell you, if they invite us back, it'll be a miracle. 
I hear this warning. I am reconstructing you. If you have eyes to hear and ears, eyes to see and ears to hear, but it's within the embrace of my Christ and my commission. I will make you, he says. I'm saying to people, I'm saying to myself, be kind on yourself. Have you, have you ever led any community beyond your family through the last two years? It's been wild. It's been a joke. It's been incredibly liberating because I've realized that in all of my leadership, there has been something lurking, which has been Ryan's ability and Ryan's personality on the Enneagram and Ryan's this and Ryan's passion and Ryan's that. And it's been such a healthy, holy self-assessment. And I've been saying, Lord, if you were to come back now, how much of you is in me and how much of you is in what I have put my hand to? I'm just being honest. Holy, holy, holy. Yay. It's been the best thing ever. And I hear him say over the church, we have a moment. But it must happen in the midst of Christ where he is our maker. We can sing all these kif lacquer songs, but he's not looking. Well, he is looking for passion and worship. It's like, does any spouse not look like, look for passion in their other spouse when they make love? Imagine, imagine that husband if your wife was blank faced. Or wife if your husband was blank faced. You're like, what the heck is this? This is not what I got married for. <laughs> Of course, there's passion and worship, but I, sorry, I apologize if that offended you. But I hear him saying, what about your passion level in obedience? What about your passion level in obedience? What about your passion level on Monday in obedience, Tuesday in obedience? And sadly, what I've noticed in the last few years, is the church, in all honest assessment, have I, as I've assessed all things, looks more like a cool country club Sunday gathering where we tick a box or don't tick a box. And if the preacher's worth his or her while, we might tip God and then get on with living life Monday through Saturday. And don't you dare ask me to be a part of, what do you call them here? A comm group or a prayer meeting. No, 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 I have to live my life, but I'll give you Sunday. The church globally has been riven with a disease called Sunday church, church attending Christianity, and Jesus will have nothing of it. And what is quite telling, I promise I'll get to the scripture, even though I've told you it's in the Bible, I promise you. What's quite telling is it's taken a crisis, not Christ, for us to realize this. What does that say? That is not a pat on our back. Well done, church leader, or well done, business leader. You need to change your financial model and your business strategy. It's wanting. It's not a pat on the back. It's an exposure of the fact of our deep immaturity, that it takes crisis. Last time I read in the Bible, it's the very last of the last of the last of the last resorts to disciple us. Look at, the, look at Israel. Sorry, can I go with this a little bit? Thank you. I've got permission from you, sir. I appreciate that. The prophets would come to Israel. Repent. I love you with an everlasting love. As the tongue and the interpretations came this morning. I love that. Yes. I love you. Repent. Turn. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I am here. Yahweh, your king, your lover. Your betrothed. It was the very last resort that the invaders came from the north to sweep them away. Exile was not their mandate. It was the very last resort. Crisis was the last resort. 
But the scriptures speak about the word and the spirit and the person of Christ in intimate relationship and in community that inspires us to become like Jesus. What does that say? We were praying about apostolic a sermon this morning. I, I don't know. But all I know is this, is Jesus did not die on the cross for a church driven by crisis. He gave his life on the cross for a community of very real, normal, stumbling, fumbling people. That's me. Maybe that's you. In intimate affection, learning to become like Jesus. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishes of humanity. Number one, this message comes in verse 17 with the word, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And we all know metanoia does not mean stop clicking on that clickbait. Stop going down that road. No, it is a change of understanding of who God is and a commensurate change of life that begins to emulate the one we see. But do you realize that it comes in Israel? In a moment, they were longing for a Messiah. They were expecting a Messiah. Are you with me? They were pleading for a Messiah. And yet Jesus, Messiah comes and says, repent, you've got it all wrong. Listen to this. The last prophetic word prior to John the baptizer was how many years prior to John? For over 400 years. In that time, stuff happened. Israel, God's people, went through all manner of processes. God was apparently silent and not doing anything. And the Greeks came through. And there was uprisings and rebellions. Alexander the Great, what, what did Alexander the Great bring to the ancient world? Greek. Koine Greek. Speaking one common language. Uprisings and suddenly Pax Romana came with a dove. No, with a sword. We will bring peace. Listen to me or I'll take your head off. Now, wow, that's quite something. But what did the Romans bring? Roman roads. And in all of this time, while God was apparently silent and not doing anything in the midst of crisis and apparent abandonment and, oh, woe is me, God, you're not for me, God, you're not with me, there, God is working behind the scenes in the midst of all things, setting up humanity for the fullness of time when Christ would come with a common language. And roads that would reach to the farthest periphery of the known world. That when Messiah would come, it would explode. Wow. But there's little old Israel. Not with ears to hear and eyes to see. And they moaning. God, you've abandoned us. Discouraged, of course. The, the Messiah's coming is delayed, delayed, delayed. God is never late. Just as well as Gandalf said, wizards are always on time. And God is not a wizard. It's just a story. God is never late, but he never works according to Kronos time. He works according to Kairos time, fullness of time moments where things begin to apparently conspire but collude for the coming of the kingdom. But in this moment, their desire for a Messiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, son of man, suffering servant, instead of the desire for the son of man, a suffering servant, guess what they began to long for? A military king that looked more like Caesar than Christ. Now, what's the lesson? We are going through some stuff. 
Last time I checked, Jesus himself said, as the powers of the future age, the end of the age, the consummation of the age is pressing into the present. The birth pains of the upheaval of a fallen world anticipating renewal will begin to increase. He did not say the storms and the riots and the this and the that would get less and less. It would increase. He wasn't saying that was a good thing. He was saying it's coming. Don't lose heart. And then he even says, do not fear, for I have overcome the world. But he is to prepare us to anticipate that so that we know how to handle ourselves in the moment. But the problem with all of this stuff is it's revealed that we need a process of repentance. Repentance is not an Old Testament word. It's not a naughty, horrible, belittling word. It is a holy, gracious word by the power of the Spirit in love and kindness that says, Ryan, the way that you've been seeing me, I corner, nyaga, nyaga, stop it. This is who I am. It would be arrogant of me, to say the least, if I stood before you right now and said, I have the full view of who God is. You, you would run out of this church. I hope. Equally so, if it's true of the preacher, it's true of every person. Because when we go through stuff, guess what happens? We begin to reduce the majesty, the brilliance of Messiah to a God who reflects our needs more than his mission. What did I say there? <laughs> when we go through those processes dumb, the reality is, is we reduce the majesty and the beauty of who God is to a God who looks more like a God who reflects our needs than the God of his mission. The Psalm of Solomon, it was not the Song of Songs or the Psalms, came out during that time, this intertestament period. And guess what their epitome of Messiah was? A king with a sword coming to deliver Israel from their oppressors. And that's who they wanted. And here Jesus stands before them, born in a manger. And he says, repent. Repent. Right now, Oasis Church, and this could be any church around the world right now. The word of the Lord is coming to us, and he's saying, repent. I am not the Republican God. I am not the Democrat God. I am not the God of the MP, Nationalist Party. Do you remember that? Hopefully not. I am equally not the God of the ANC, or the EFF, or the ACDP. I am not a political God. Stop taking sides. I am not the God of the whites or the blacks or the pinks or the greens. Stop reducing me to color. I am not the God who is Methodist, God who is Pentecostal, God who is charismatic, God who is reformed. We are riven with reductions of who he is. And do you know what it does? It makes us into tribal Christians. Sectarian Christians. You get the cool skinny jeans Christians. And then, Shona, you get the plead pants Christians. And you get all the crizzies that are cool and they say the cool things and they into the cool things and they drink cappuccinos and lattes from Legacy Cafe. <laughs> and they read all the coolos. And who are the coolos? They're into the Stephen Furtix and the, I don't even know. They, I think Stephen Furtix is cool. I don't listen to him. Uh, but when I see him on stage, he looks kiff. Nice, nice vibe, bro. And then you get the others, and they into the, I don't know, I don't know, the John Wimbers. 
Derek Morphews, the O's that I'm actually into. <sighs> and it's a mess. We reduce him to our need. And the problem is this. All we live for is the breakthrough of our circumstances. And do you know what is at stake? Legacy. I, I, Melissa and I sat. Oh, Lord, help me. We sat on our veranda. God has, when, when I say God has spoken to us about a home of our own, when I say it's more than a dozen times, it's, it's easily more than a dozen. But like just rushing at us. I will provide. I will provide. I know, you know. Hey, we're looking at bank accounts. Yo, where's the provision? Till we actually realize that the word that he's bringing is less about our ability and his supernatural gifted ability. And actually of late, he's been teaching me something else, which I won't go into in a minute. For a minute. But we looked at each other with a stark realization that there is a chance in our little Matthew's lives that we might never be able to give our kids an inheritance that looks like rands and cents, brick and mortar. And then we realized this, we might not be able to give them an inheritance, but they're definitely gonna get a legacy. And we will not sacrifice the gift of a legacy on the altar of letting our lives become wrapped up in pursuit of an inheritance. And this is what he began to show us, Dom, that in pursuit of a legacy, which is a way to think, a way to behave, a way to act, a way to dream in spite of what's coming in your direction, they will definitely get an inheritance. But I want to ask you this, in reducing all of God to your circumstances, are you abandoning Oasis Church, the pursuit of legacy living at the expense of reducing to the God just to get you through? Because at the end of the day, the greatest gift I can give my kids it's when the, the bad line, Scar, is screaming in my face, breathing death threats, and I stand and I worship Yahweh. You can take my life, but you're never going to take my worship. You can take my stuff, but you're never going to take my worship. And that's what turned Nebuchadnezzar. The fact that before they went into a fire, they said, you can bring whatever my way. But we're not stopping our following of Yahweh. That's what turned a nation. A heart of legacy. Not trying to feather their own nests. Not trying to look after their own comfort and convenience. I'm telling you, now, the greatest enemy of the church is not a horned devil. It is the seduction of a form of Christianity that reduces the wild majesty of Yahweh revealed in the flesh of Christ to this comfort and convenience of attending church on a Sunday. A good meeting. Oh, God help us. Oh, God help the church. It's not what it's about. It's about Jesus following him. I don't know how long I've been preaching. Can you just give me a little bit longer, please? I've got to just release a bit more. We are not being conformed to our past. Get to awake. I know Mads. I know her stuff. I endorse it. I love it. It's incredible. People are projecting their past traumas on their present. And guess who's copying the majority of the blame? God! 
We are not being conformed to our past. We are not even being conformed to our present. Not the trauma of the past or the crisis or even the abundance of the present. You think crisis reveals your heart. Favor truly reveals the state of our hearts. It's not the, the, the crisis or the abundance of the present. It's not our personalities. We are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. Not Enneagram number eight. Not strength finders. Definitely not Myers-Briggs. Those are all helpful. But that's not who we're being transformed to. And I'm into that stuff, man. We are not being transformed into the popular culture of the day. Friedrich Nietzsche, atheist, said, one of the last signs of the demise of a culture or a society is what is known as the last man society. And guess what it looks and smells like? It looks like this. To sidestep and eradicate sacrifice, suffering, and cost at all costs. And to live the most convenient, comfortable life that suits me. Frederick Nietzsche, atheist, last man society, says when you see that, run. I am not a naysayer or a doomsdayer. I'm not. But I carry prophetic eyes to see. And we are watching the demise of Western culture. We are in a global Western crisis of leadership. We are in trouble. Church, do not take the cue or be conformed to the popular culture of the day. It might not be popular in heaven. We are being conformed to the image of breathtaking Jesus. Ray, who's more kind and more compassionate than the PC bunch. He's more fiery than the re revolutionaries. He's more generous than George Soros. And who's that other O from Pretoria? That guy. Leon Musk. Elon. Leon. Yeah, it should have been Leon. They got confused there. <laughs> Jesus. We being transformed into him. And then quickly, in two minutes, he calls. He says, come. That means you got to move. Spirit of obedience over the church. Radical obedience. Guys, they were confused. Messiah didn't make sense. But this is what I was hearing in prayer while we were praying this morning. It was a wonderful prayer time. I heard that the word come would come with such resonant harmony and would begin to move on our heartstrings. And even though we didn't understand, something was pulling on us. I've got to live for Jesus. Doesn't matter that this doesn't make sense to my situation. I've got to live for him. I will leave everything. I must live for him. Abraham did it. Peter did it. Andrew did it. Will we do it? And he calls not Ryan on his lonesome. He calls a company. I am not the church. I saw that on Facebook. I want to punch the oak through Facebook. I am the church. I wanted to say things that I used to say before I came to faith. He was talking the biggest load of nonsense. I can never be the church. The church is a body of very fragile stumbling human beings shoulder to shoulder becoming like Jesus. Oh no, I can have this kingdom thing on my own. Don't talk rubbish. You cannot have it at home, online. If you're at online for all the good reasons, yes, all cool. But if you're at home having a cup of tea because it's comfortable in your pajamas, that's not church. 
And that's why I'm not on Facebook anymore because you can't tell me to my Facebook how much you don't like what I'm saying. Yeah, like choose your battles. Stay off Facebook. You cannot be a part of a church halfway around the world. They are local shepherded congregations by men and women who are living real lives that are praying real prayers in their presence for you, doing their best to love on you and lay down their lives for you. And the thing is, you think it's all about you. There is someone, sure, the fire of God. There is someone who existed before creation, God. There is someone who existed before the fall, God. There is someone who is greater than the crucifixion, God. There is someone who outstrips the consummation of the age, God. And we have made all of eternity about us. The theologians of any worth nowadays describe the gospel as this. The reinstallment of Christ as king in his temple. Can you hear? Nothing about forgiveness of sins, redemption, delivering us from evil. Nothing. It's about him. And all theologians worth their salt, and we can go toe to toe, say this. Messiah, before Messiah means anything, it means king. And when Jesus was called the son of God, it wasn't a nice self-help, introspective uh, Christian teaching. It meant king. Psalm 2, here is my son whom I love. In him I am well pleased. It was a reprise of Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? I have installed my king on Zion, my son whom I love. It's a statement of his divine dominion and rule over all things. And because he's king, he is the supreme savior and deliverer and provider of humanity. But we all want a savior, yet we don't want a king. Whew. I love you, I promise. I do. God is delivering his church of this I, God's delivering the church of this obsession with self. Who are you, Lord, and what shall I do? Come, follow me, and I will make you a company. Look, just look around. Guys, it's normal, man. Like me. I get sick. Less and less, thankfully. Anti-inflammatory diet. I get tired. I get fed up with oaks in the traffic. Yo, you shouldn't have seen me on Friday. I don't swear, but I wanna. Normal. And then he says, and this is what I'm making you for. Not for the Matthews legacy or the Hogarty legacy or the Oasis legacy or the Freedom House legacy. I'm making you disciples of human beings across the planet. When last did you wake up and go, who can I impart the beauty and the majesty of Jesus to? As a disciplined learner. And last time I checked, that's what he's coming to check up on me. Not if I've surfed pipeline like I dreamt of or surf the Maldives, or Indo, or traveled all the countries I want to, he's not checking up on that, he's going to eyeball me, Ryan Oliver Matthews, and he's going to say, boy, I burned in your belly at 17, what you've done with it, but Lord, I, I led a cool church, you know, a couple of cool, I planted a couple of cool churches, and we said cool stuff, and, and look at all of our, we're the disciples, boy, not in that kind of, voice but more like Sean Connery maybe <laughs> where are the people in your slipstream in the dust of your steps that look like me 
but Lord, didn't you see me throw out the net that Sunday on the 18th of August, 19, you know, 1999, and, and 1,700 people gave their lives to me. Where are they? No, but we got their numbers, and, 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 and the next week we threw out the net again. It's not about conversions. It's not about hands raised on a Sunday. It's about who is following Jesus because of us. And I want you to know something. Jesus never played for the crowd. The crowd put him on a cross. He's looking for hungry, humble, normal. I'm, this man here, I can't take my eyes off you, bro. Yes, you're handsome. Good call, lady. But my goodness, there is such a hunger emanating out of you. I can see it all over you. This is what you are made for. Not for Sunday church attending Christianity, hey? Hungry for Jesus. But you're such a normal guy with real things just like me. Hang-ups, irritations, road things, normal. That's the kind of guy that Jesus wants. And that's the kind of girl that Jesus can use. But I can see hunger coming out of you. That's all he's looking for. He's not looking for perfection. Did you check Peter out in the Bible? Charlie, eh? Absolute Charlie. Absolute, no, no. If he can use Peter, he can use you. If he can use Peter, he can use you. Now's your time. Sir, I don't know your name, but Jesus does, and he's calling you. I can see the resonant call of God burning in your belly. Now's your time. Come, follow Jesus, and let him make you a disciple of nations. Oasis, I love you. God bless you. See you sometime. No, I'm kidding. We are done, though. We are done. We are done. You, Jesus, this is holy, man. This is normally when I run out of my church. I'm serious. There's holy fire coming on, on the pulpit again. It's not hardcore Christianity. It's just talking truth. Okay, shall we stand together and pray? I think we should pray. Andrew's giving me those Andrew eyebrows. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, you know, best thing is you talk to your king. Why don't you do that? And then I'll just pray briefly at the end. Just take a moment. If you need to forgive me, forgive me. <laughs> Quickly. But just talk to Jesus, please. I'm remembering my friend's song. I remember actually when we stumbled into it and he ended up writing it. I will follow Jesus everywhere he goes. Lord, we, we come before you and we are we're amazed by your loving kindness like a flood. Here is love vast as an ocean, loving kindness like a flood. Where the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. We worship you, O God of revival and God of revivals. We worship you, O God of the crucifixion. Mostly God of the resurrection. We worship you, O Lord our God, throughout ages. We honor you. And we say, Lord, we're beginning to hear your crystal clear clarion call in the midst of our circumstances, and something is beginning to resonate within us. We want Jesus. We want to follow you. We want to look like you. We want to think like you. We want to act like you. We want to move like you. We want to minister like you. You did not come as a prophetic symbol or substitute. 
You came as the example, the God man, fully man, without sin, filled with the Spirit, who chose the way of his Father. Today, like you, and I didn't even get to say this, although I wanted to, we emulate you. We're in the wilderness. You were tempted to take every other possible way to owning the nations. And you followed the way of your Father. Like you, we follow the way of our King Jesus. We reject the same temptation that you received. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life to expedite and speed up things. But we choose to follow your way. And we hear your call to come to follow Jesus. And we give you thanks that by your kind grace and mercy, you make us and you shape us. Not that we can parade our new flashy status, but that we can lay down our lives as servants and discipling nations. The ultimate reflection of our walk with you is not our salvation or even our sanctification to sons and daughters. Although we love it, Lord, we thank you for it. But it's all of what that culminates in. Lay down lives of servants and discipling nations. Oh God, use us, motley crew. I thank you that you're using Oasis. Would you take it to another level, Lord? No excuses in the house. No romantic views of the past that become tools for victimhood. Oh God, you are leading us onward and upward and you are burning in our belly. That young man that I spoke to in a moment ago, I pray it would not only be one today burning in their bones, but there would be every single person, even online and even right now, where people have taken decisions not to, to be a part of family. Burning! in pajamas right now in the name of Jesus burning upon your church burning with love burning with wonder burning with the beauty of Jesus and so I bless you Oasis I bless you to prosper I bless you to thrive I bless you to fall more in love with Jesus I bless you to rise to the call of the King I bless you to fling wide your arms to receive the great grace of God that enables you to rise. I bless you. And the Lord rebukes sickness in this place in the name of Jesus. Every long-term assignment of sickness, the Lord rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And we proclaim your word of healing. We give you thanks, O Lord, for your, for your body broken and your blood shed for our forgiveness and our healing. And God, would you turn circumstances in Jesus' mighty name. But God, as we said with a few yesterday, you're less concerned about the storms around us. You're more concerned about the storms inside of us. So God, still the storms. And let your church arise. Raymond Dyack, burn in the name of Jesus. As you were reading Finney today, you were reading about yourself. Burn in the name of Jesus. Burn in this place. Fresh fire in the house, God. Fresh baptisms of holy, holy fire in the name of Jesus. It's not just for the skinny jeans, cool few. It's for everybody, young, old. Burning fire in this place. Not just for the 44-year-old strange preacher up front and the paid professionals. It's for everyone. Burning fire. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.